This episode is being brought to you by our great friends over at ProFi 2020. ProFi is a full-service dental CPA firm that provides bookkeeping services, monthly financial reports, managerial accounting services, and proactive tax service to growth-oriented dentists around the country. ProFi was born in a dental practice out of their owner's frustrations with the dental accounting industry. Chris Sands actually managed a dental practice early in his career, learning the business from the ground up. During that time, he found that it was nearly impossible to get thorough financial reporting for the practice and even more difficult to get any kind of proactive guidance. That's when he and his business partner, CPA Brent Sonnier, decided to fix it for themselves. ProFi 2020 is proactive in a notoriously reactive industry. Most accounting firms, especially in dentistry, deal only with the past. ProFi provides detailed reporting, growth-oriented advice, and dental-specific strategies to their clients to ensure that they are positioned for healthy long-term growth. On a personal note, I can definitely endorse ProFi as my CPA firm of choice. And the two years that I've been with them have been the best in regards to organization and implementing advanced strategies to decrease my tax liability. If you'd like to get started or learn more, schedule your free financial x-ray and get half off the onboarding cost for being a listener of the Dentalpreneur Podcast. Just go to profi, P-R-O-F-I 2020.com forward slash DSI. That's profi 2020.com forward slash DSI. The Dentalpreneur Podcast. Okay, doctor, it's time to put down that handpiece. You're listening to the show dedicated to helping dentists get their lives back. It's time to decrease your stress, increase your profitability, and regain your passion. Now introducing your host, Dr. Mark Costas. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Dentalpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Costas. What's up, friends? I hope you're doing great out there today. This is a Surgical Saturday. So if you guys want to hear more about surgery, continue listening to my voice. Uh, If you guys are looking for more practice management, leadership, culture, systemization, EBITDA, those sorts of things, uh, this is not the episode for you, but we are doing um, a surgically based, clinically based episode at least once per week now. Uh, and they are on Saturdays, whether or not you're listening to this on a Saturday uh, is intended to go out every Saturday. And of course, the people that I typically feature are the founders of the Colorado Surgical Institute, Dr. Dan Brisky and Dr. Tahir Dune. This is uh, the two of those great surgeons actually speaking at our most recent mastermind event in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, they gave a co-presentation on getting to the point where you could be considered a super GP. Now, this is a relatively new term, probably within the last 10 years or so, when the skill sets of general practitioners began to evolve and become more sophisticated due to the amount of continuing education that was being offered in the marketplace. Colorado Surgical, I believe, is one of the best uh, domestic surgical training facilities because there's a couple states, actually a handful of states, the ones that I know for sure are Arizona and Colorado, where you could get a temporary permit. So if you are a licensed dentist in any of the 50 states, you can get a temporary license in the state of Arizona, Colorado, and a handful of others. Uh, and you can actually put hands on patients. So that allows places like Colorado Surgical Institute to screen patients, to do case planning, and to actually have students come and perform certain clinical procedures on those patients with a mentor standing over their shoulder. So I think it's a very, very um, useful law that these couple of states have been able to enact. And it keeps, I believe... Um, a higher level of scrutiny and quality control 
to these procedures that we are teaching um, without having to go overseas. And you can also assure that they're going to get adequate post-op care and that anything that needs follow-up, say for instance, a restoration on top of an implant is actually going to get done because they are attached to private practices. Uh, so Dr. Tayer Dune and Dr. Dan Prisky, both working out of each of their practices in Colorado have been able to um, create a very, very interesting and effective training protocol uh, there in Colorado. At this particular event, they were speaking about how to become an effective super GP. They, they speak specifically about the transition from general practitioner to super GP. They talk about the ethical considerations in dental training and practice. They touched on the journey of professional growth in dentistry. They discussed the challenges of complex dental cases, and they talked about the need for careful case selection and patient management in super GP offices. All right, guys, I hope you get a ton of value from this Surgical Saturday. And my great friends, Dr. Tahir Dune and Dr. Dan Brisky, we'll talk to you soon. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. All right, next up, my two great friends, uh, co-founders, uh, of the Colorado Surgical Institute. We're going to be talking about transitioning from a general practitioner to a super GP. Um, we have Dr. Dan Brisky and Dr. Tahir Dune here, two of the most gifted um, surgeons that I've ever come across. Uh, if you guys haven't had the opportunity to go to Colorado Surgical, even as an observer, you would see something very, very cool. We talked about this yesterday that Colorado and Arizona and a couple other states um, – have this really unique um, opportunity for hands-on education because you can apply for a temporary license and put your hands on actual patients with an active license anywhere in the United States. So at Colorado Surgical, it's attached to Dr. Brisky and Dr. Dune's um, offices, and Dr. Dune just did a huge expansion um, it, with with an educational center also within his uh within his, the four walls of his office, of his practice. So they actually vet patients. Um, uh, they, they handle all the post-op. So it's different about Colorado Surgical versus other, um, say, international programs, is that they have post-op care, uh, follow-up care, and every single one of the prosthetics, uh, I'm sorry, every single one of the Implants are actually restored within, uh, within the office. So you know that, um, I don't, you guys may or may not know this, but if you go to say a course in the Dominican Republic or Tijuana and they guarantee you 30 implants placed, there's a very, very high likelihood that zero of those implants get restored. So those poor patients are basically just getting, um, implants placed in, any different direction uh, without any regard for a restorative plan. And, and most times they don't ever get restored. So ethically speaking, I think that a lot of those courses um, kind of walk a very fine line of between ethical and unethical. But uh, you know that at Colorado Surgical, all of those cases are going to get restored. If an implant fails, they deal with it there um, within their practice. They keep very, very close notes, just like a private practice in any of your offices. So totally different experience. Um, and uh, the mentors are incredible. These are the two guys that developed the curriculum. We also have IV sedation uh, that has started there now. Dr. Dune's uh, brother, like I said yesterday, is a board certified medical anesthesiologist, and he wrote the IV sedation course. It's going to be one of the best in the country. So if you guys are ever interested in IV sedation, um, advanced surgical stuff like uh, single implants, um, wisdom teeth, uh, and all on X procedures. Um, and they're also going to talk about today block grafting, um, ridge augmentation, lateral sinus lifts, and those sorts of things. They do it all. We do it all over there at Colorado Surgical. We'd love to see you there. So without further ado, my two great friends, Dr. Dan Brisky and Dr. Tahir Dune, both um, uh, mastermind members. And Dr. Dune is a black belt coach as well. All right. So um, what we're going to be talking about today is sometimes a little advanced, and I don't want anyone to be like, okay, that's further than where I am currently. 
So I'm just going to turn my brain off and just look at the bloody pictures and x-rays and not get anything out of it. What I want you to do is understand that everything advanced stacks on top of everything else. So everything from flap design to, you know, profound anesthetic will lead you to a successful surgery. Yep. I've always been a believer of stay one step ahead of where you currently are uh, knowledgely when it comes to surgery. So if you're doing implants, start thinking like full arch, right? Or if you're doing uh, some simple EXTs, learn wisdom teeth. Because when you come back, you're going to be 90% faster, right? Because you just went above where you were. And could I have, oh, I guess it's not showing up there. Now we're good. All right. I apologize, guys. So essentially what we're going to talk about is how we evolved from um, GPs to super GPs. But first we want to kind of define what a super GP is. And I think it's important to go back and kind of understand like the culture of, you know, depending on when you graduated, what was told to us in school. A lot of the time we're told you cannot do these things. You're not trained enough to do these things. And then through the evolution of how we do dentistry, a lot of these procedures are happening in GP practices everywhere. I mean, all the way up into like zygomatic implants and transnasals and transsinus. And I'm not saying that anyone is right or wrong and how they believe uh, philosophically how they do things. But what I am saying is if you are trained and you're competent and you're confident and you're doing everything, you know, from a Hippocratic oath perspective, then consider upping your surgical game or upping your game into more complex procedures. So old school, like the guy I bought my practice from, he started practicing. He wasn't even wearing gloves, you know, and, and things do evolve over time. We have to understand that like, the, the culture and the philosophy and the stories that we tell ourselves are the number one limiting beliefs. Every time we run a course in the beginning, we ask all of our attendees, like, what is holding you back? Why did you sign up for this course? What are you trying to get out of this course? And a lot of the times it's they're just trying to get the confidence to make sure they do the procedure properly. But then at the same time that they do no harm. And that's what holds them back is they're, they don't want to do wrong by their patients. And that's a good and a very ethical place to start from. Well, my clicker may be out of batteries. Nope, it's just me again. So uh, Dr. Brisky, if you want to kind of touch base on like how you evolved into, um, you know, a super GP, you know, if we, we define what a super GP is, and the steps you took to kind of stack all those skill sets on top of one another. Yeah, of course. So uh, out of school, I felt like I was told I couldn't do anything above a surgical extraction. Uh, I wasn't allowed to do ortho. Uh, I was like, what is it? What am I going to do? <laughs> right? I felt like, what am I going to do? I don't even feel confident in doing a filling or an MOD. So where do you go from here? Right. So I think it was a search of how to get knowledge and where do I fit in in the adventure? Um, where, where am I going to go? So what I found through the evolution for myself, a lot of my friends is first we, I did a residency, uh, during the residency, I took implant classes. So residency, they say, Hey, it's going to be so stressful. You know, don't do anything else, but do the residency. So I took implant classes and I also worked on the weekends, <laughs> right? I was bored. I was very, very bored. So I definitely recommend people to first start off with surgical extractions. That's a big one. Uh, and molar endo. I think those are the two biggest ones I got re really interested uh, and got my hands hands to start working. Uh, I think in the beginning uh, or when you're evolving, it's it's really you have to stay a few steps ahead clinically in your knowledge standpoint, and then eventually your hands will catch up. Yeah. So for, for those of you who have associates, um, you know, I don't know if you guys know Aaron Nicholas's course. I sent all my associates through his course. Like get good at endo first, right? Learn how to do molar, endo, build up root canal and crown. Secondarily, get good at surgical extractions. Then you can consider one type of sedation or, or not. Oral sedation, IV sedation, it's kind of like whatever your preference is. And then you add in bone grafting, socket preservation, ridge preservation, single implants. It's like however you want to stack these skill sets on top of each other, it takes time to get there. I've been doing this for 12 years and, you know, when I first graduated, I, you know, would go out with some of the docs. Some of them would be 10 years out and I'd be like, okay, you guys are old dogs, you know, and I just felt like I knew everything. And then looking back on things, you know, right when I hit about eight or nine years, that's when I felt like I hit my stride. 
And so it does take time. So for those of you who are younger getting into the game, just understand like this whole thing takes time to get there and you can't get there right away. Um, but part of the whole process, and it's cliche for a reason, it's just like enjoy the journey, enjoy the time it takes to learn the things that it that's necessary to do a good clinical uh, job. So when to refer, we're never going to stand from behind the podium and say, do not refer to a specialist like that is not the philosophy. I don't want that to be the optics. But what we are saying is maybe refer less for multiple reasons right? Your patients want to stay with you. They want to do the work with you. They don't want to have two different teams to meet or three different teams to meet. Some of the cases we're going to show is we did the implant, we did his ortho, we did his wisdom teeth. He didn't want to go to three separate offices and have three separate financial plans and meet three different teams and go all over the county to, to get his treatment. Like these patients want to stay with you. So starting from that standpoint, your patients have chosen you for a reason and they didn't choose a specialist for a reason. They don't have a relationship there. Uh, but two, Dr. Brisky and myself still probably refer procedures to this day. I still refer cases to my specialist, but it's just few and far between. And then if you think Sometimes of it- Sometimes the local oral surgeon might say, oh, oh, I just got a referral from Dr. Dune. Yeah, <laughs> it's right. a very tough case. <laughs> so, and that's the thing. That's what you want, right? The specialist needs to like know when you send them a referral that they got to eat their Wheaties that morning, right? That they just should expect that. And then that's how you know you're doing a good job. Um, I'm and then also, consistently like going to dinners with my specialists, building relationships. I have periodontists I love. I have prosthodontists I love. I have an oral surgeon that I love. I have an EMT that I love. Uh, so part of the journey, too, is building up who's going to back you up, right? So I can help keep a lot of people out of trouble these days and I how to keep myself out of trouble. Uh, but I also have a few specialists that help me out with everything. 100% agree with what Dr. Brisky is saying. Like, take the time. It's almost like the pendulum swings the other direction and you're the one who's making the relationship with the specialist. You're the one going to them saying, hey, if I have a question... Can I run it by you? Do you have a good book you could recommend for me to read? Like our specialist gave me his pterygoid book and I started getting into pterygoids. So make relationships with the specialists in your area. Um, maybe you're the one sending them a gift basket every once in a while. Who knows? <laughs> so um, continuity of patient care, we already covered. Profitability. So I'm going to cover profitability real quick. I mean, right, this is DSI. We teach overhead. We teach how to run a profitable business. I want to make sure we touch on these, um, these philosophies for you. So, oh, actually, I'm going to segue real quick. So Alex has come through the Colorado Surgical Institute. And I want to reverse this really quick and just say, okay, why are we doing what we're doing, right? The, the impact to these patients. And we'll let Alex tell his story. He's like an over-the-top personality. But what I want you to kind of glean from this is even your patients who are introverted to some sense still do feel this type of joy they may look in the mirror and just be like, okay, that looks good. And then not give you the big over the top type of like cheer. But I guarantee you the impact that what you've done for them to their loved ones, to their children, to their parents, to their spouses is very impactful. Keeping these procedures in house and having that impact on your patients is impactful for your team. It will change the way that you feel about the work you do. Uh, and I can speak for myself in that regard, at least like that has changed my outlook on things. The connections with the patients has profoundly changed the way I look at the profession that I chose to do, because sometimes it's a thankless job. Sometimes it's overwhelming. Sometimes you feel like you're on the hamster wheel, just clocking in and doing the same thing over and over again, like it's Groundhog's Day. But when I do procedures like this, it does break up the monotony of the job. It does make it more interesting. It does make it more fulfilling for myself. And maybe I won't have Alex's story for you. So I apologize. So <laughs> I promise this is a good one. So to segue into, um, the profitability of this in your practice, and then, um, and then we'll tie, tie into clinical and I'll have Dr. Brisky kind of run through all of the clinical procedures for you. If you were to just think about starting five orthodontic cases a month, right? It's $6,000 per ortho case. That comes out to $360,000 of revenue per year. So very simply, like five starts per month. These cases are in your practice. 
they are there. You just need to talk about orthodontics in your practice. Now, granted, some of you who understand like, you know, annuities and all of that really well are going to say, well, you're not going to get paid your, your 6,000 bucks right up front. That's true. You know, you're going to build this thing over time. Your ortho patients are going to be paying you a monthly over time. With sleep apnea, it's kind of the same thing. 3,500 bucks a case. You're helping people breathe better. You're giving them back a vitality that they need. You're helping them um, have energy and lift the fog that's present every single morning for them. So with sleep apnea, you can add an extra 210,000 per year. With wisdom teeth, if you do five wisdom tooth cases a month, there's an extra $120,000 of revenue, not profit, but revenue per year. Implants, 120, and then full arch at $25,000 a case, an extra $300,000 of revenue per year. So just by adding these procedures to the mix, without adding an extra marketing budget, you can add a significant amount of revenue to your practice. And this is why we want you guys to at least consider the options of specialty procedures into your business, because at the end of the day, there is a lot of procedures and referrals and revenue leaving your practice. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to run through some cases. And if you guys have any questions specifically, just write them down when we get to the end of the case. We'll definitely answer any questions you have specifically about the clinical stuff. But I guarantee you the third slide in is going to probably answer the question maybe that you do have. Cool. So this first one, Edgar, this is a patient where you look at the CT and you're like, man, there's a lot of stuff in here I can do in my practice. I can do wisdom teeth. I can do ortho. uh, And you can actually do an implant as well. But the implant on this one is a little bit of a harder one. So this one, there's about three millimeters of bone width. So these are pretty cool cases. So Dr. Dew and I would tackle these together when we first met like six years ago, <laughs> right? We would sit up there like, man, how do we do those in our own practice? Like, what, what, what are the next steps? Because at the time we could do ortho, we could do the wisdom teeth, but we couldn't place the implant, right? So for majority of time, this is a referral, right? This is a referral to your favorite oral surgeon or periodontist. And this would be still a pretty tough case. Yeah, if I were to poll the audience, right? You got a missing number eight. Who here would do a bridge on a 20 year old, right? This Edgar is 20. Yeah. Let's say like 21 to 23 that we're not worried about growth, but who's doing, right. Who's doing a bridge versus an implant versus yeah. a Maryland bridge versus a flipper. Right. I mean, and feel free to shout out the answer. If there's something that we haven't considered as a, you know, modality here, like in this, in this case, you know, at least my belief as we sit here today is a 20 year old with a missing central is going to need an implant in this site and not any type of like uh, crown and bridge type of work. So traditionally, yeah, this is going to go to your specialist. What I want to encourage you guys to consider is forms of ridge augmentation that seem that is like too complex to do actually is easier to do than you think. It's more case selection. It's making sure the habitual nature of these patients will follow the, the rules and regulations you set forth for them. Uh, otherwise, you know, they're otherwise healthy. There's no comorbidities occurring. There's no like immunosuppressants or certain medications that are taking them south. But it, a lot of these cases can get done in your practice. And we want to make sure we at least demystify how to do these procedures for you. Right. So you can do these ones in your own practice because I look at this one in a few years out of school. It's like, man, this is too complicated. I've seen a similar case on Facebook where they took a plate from the ramus. They screwed the ramus block in. Right, they packed the middle with autogenous. They closed it up. They opened it. They did a soft tissue graph. Blah blah blah. Like a million things at the same time. Uh, What we found is using something as simple as a vertebral graft. So this graft is actually from Rocky Mountain Tissue Bank, and it mimics the natural immune response of the body because the outer outer shell of the block is actually hard. It has a cortical shell. The inner is more of a matrix. It's a spongy bone. So when the bo- when this goes into the body, the body uh, thinks it's its own bone. It's pretty cool. So those blocks that are just very, very hard, kind of concrete cortical blocks or J blocks, those don't work as well. You see a lot more resorption because of blood flow in these things. So when I found this block graft technique, I think it was back in like 2016, 2017, I was like, man, is this going to work? So uh, it took me about five years to just be like, hey, I perfected this. I know what to do. I can show people how to do this easily in their own practices. 
Yeah, one of the things that I like about Colorado Surgical is that we actually get a massive amount of repetition on this uh, via our attendees, but also Dr. Brisky and myself doing this in private practice. And then we learn how to manage all the complications. And then we were covering these with pericardium at one point, and we were seeing a lot of tissue dehiscences where like the tissue opens up. And the reason why is you get this sharp, you know, cortical block graft underneath the tissue. You've released the periosteum. So now the tissue is thinner on top of the block graft. And then through abrasion, you can have these uh, little microscopic openings. You get bacteria that leaks in, your block graft's going to fail, right? You get any of this bacterial migration, epithelial migration into your bone graft, it's going to fail. However, then Dr. Brisky, we start to see a, a whole slew of failures comes in and we go and we source different products and we find that the Alloderm GBR material through BioHorizons, when you cover your block graft with that, these things don't open up anymore. And so what we'll talk about is like, okay, how exactly do you take a block graft from a cadaver's neck, right? A vertebral block graft and then fixate it down to the maxilla and then have the body regenerate like the, the human body is very amazing in this way. So even on this one, so Dune and I tried to pick cases where things are not perfect. <laughs> so we can show everyone where to actually help uh, and prove the cases. Because if you look at this one where, where number eight is, and you're getting to the base of the nose, you see that big defect right there? Uh, that's going to resorb later down the road. So that's one spot that we should have grafted, grafted with either allograft or max or a xenograft to prevent any resorption. So little things like that. And for this one, and so this thinks, is my case. Yeah, who thinks this is a good placement? Yes or no? Like, give me a yes. Good placement. How about bad placement? Bad, bad placement. Yes. Yep. Why though, right? The reason is that implant, the apex of that implant is not in native bone. So it's not stable right now. So I place the implant. It feels great. I take the x-ray, you know, I have it prosthetically set up where the implant's coming out through the cingulum. So prosthetically, I can restore this really well. If I were to leave this implant in this patient, and there's torsional force going out every time the patient grinds and clenches, every time they go through function. There's no native bone holding this in. When we see freak failures on our side, you, we see that oftentimes there's too much graft material around your implant. What you want to consider is getting, even if you have to do a cement retained restoration, getting the apex of the implant into native bone. And so it took me three different shots to redirect this thing. That's my beautiful <laughs> painting. <laughs> so that's the right trajectory, right? <laughs> so he took it out and he corrected it. So anytime we're doing block grafting or implants on the anterior, especially, I actually mid procedure, I'll I'll go and take a CT right before I send them out. Okay, and then redirected. Now there's a lot of bone. So, I mean, some perio articles you read is say ideal is four millimeters of bone on the front side of the implant and four millimeters of tissue. So how is this ever going to resorb now? And then you got to think about the end in mind also, right? This kid's 20. People are living longer. He has a huge runway ahead of him. What we do, ideally, we need to set him up for success. Um, sometimes if the patients are in their 80s, you know, there's a, maybe a potentially a different approach to take versus someone who's in their 20s. You got to just take all the factors into consideration when approaching these cases. And here's another one. Same tooth, actually, and a little bit less bone on this one. Right. So this one's got like almost three millimeters of bone or less. And there's really nothing apical to it either. So where are you going to put the tip of that implant? Right. So tough one. And most of the time we saw, I used to think this was a referral case or a ramus block case is what I was thinking. And, and there's different techniques outside of just a traditional block graft. There's something called the sausage technique. I mean, once I describe it, you're going to understand why they call it that. You take a membrane and you tack down three sides of the membrane. So you have one open area of the membrane. And then you harvest some autogenous bone or you, you do PRF and you mix it with your bone graft. And then you just shove bone graft material into the membrane. 
and then you swing that membrane over the top and then you tack it down. So you're basically stuffing the sausage. So you can do that with autogenous bone in these areas and still get very predictable results. You just have to learn how to then harvest a lot of autogenous bone. The harvesting in itself, right? You got to go to different surgical sites. That's why we like the Rocky Mountain Tissue Bank bone blocks so much is because they have high success rates and then you don't have huge harvest sites you need to go to. Yep. So when you place a block graft like this, and this one especially, see how there's that space again? So what happened was, long term, this actually resorbed. See that? Now, this is one uh, this is one complaint that I see a lot about block grafts. They say it resorbs or edges are too sharp, uh, the soft tissue pokes through and I lose my graft, right? So it's either it resorbs or it pokes through and you lose the graft. But there's two ways to prevent it. Now, when I did this one, I think this one was like maybe five years ago when I did this one. And I was like, man, there's got to be a better way. What's, what's going on? So what I started doing was after when I'm doing my block graft, I'll actually pack like a xenograft over around it. So what you're doing, you're just adding space maintenance, right? Something that's going to stick around for a lot longer so you don't get the resorption technique. So this one, I actually had to go back and you can see where the defect was, right? Looks like real bone though, right? It's not, it doesn't look like just a white sheet of concrete. It actually bleeds. It bleeds. Uh, it's very, it looks like autogenous at this point. It really does. So I grafted that defect. And could you go back to that um, previous slide? So one thing I want to point out here, maybe you can go back, who knows. But one thing I want to point out here is there's multiple things in that picture, right? Look at the flap design. Are there huge vertical releases here? Right. Every time you do a vertical release on someone, yeah, you get better visibility. So when you're learning, put in a big vertical release. But you can get a lot of tension-free retraction with an envelope. You do an envelope flap, you release the periosteum, you stretch things out, and you can get to where you need to be. And then when you close everything up and you suture, you're suturing twice as fast because you're not suturing up a vertical. Postoperatively, the patient is in less pain. If they have a high smile line, you're not going to see an incision mark, right? You don't want to have like people with beautiful smiles show incisions in the anterior component of their mouth because you had to put a vertical release in there. So all of these different things are going to stack on everything from uh, anesthetic to flap design to retraction to visibility stack on top of each other to then get to the point where you can do block rafting. Mm -hmm. So for this one, we actually grafted that defect back. Then I waited another four months and I was like, whoop, sorry, man, that was my bad. <laughs> right? I didn't know. I didn't know at that time that I should have packed that and that I would have got that type of resorption around the block graft. And we got a question from Ben. Yeah, good question. So the question is, when you do an envelope flop, um, how do you get a periosteal release incision? What I like to do is I'll get the Adson forceps and I'll pull the tissue back out. And I'll look and see where this kind of transition between the attached tissue and the mobile tissue is. And I'll make an incision on the inside of the flap just to lightly cut away the periosteum. So the periosteum is very firm and it doesn't stretch. And then once you release the periosteum, you can take these flaps and you can close anything. So now you have a, a precision incision that's occurred in between two layers of tissue. Um, and then imagine it like there's guitar strings in between. So then I'll turn my 15 the other way and I'll just run it back and forth. And it's almost like when I hit this vertical fiber in there, I'm plucking the guitar strings. And as soon as you pluck all of them, then the whole flap is going to release. And then you can close over anything. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. And if you get to the stage where you do try to do the Paros release, uh, I felt like in the, a lot of the times in the past, I tried to make periosteal and it wouldn't go anywhere. The tissue would still sit there because you've already done a surgery, right? What if you release the periosteum already? What if it doesn't stretch? So what I'll do also is you can ask you, you can take the tissue again with your Addison force up and you can take a curette. You can actually lift underneath the tissue with the curette and pull the tissue up. So that'll actually tear it a little bit better. I found that works really well. Yep. And then last thing on periosteal releases is do it in the beginning of your procedure because you will create bleeding. 
So you want the patient to clot up and you want all that hemostasis and you know, all of that to occur while your procedure continues. You don't want to do all your bone grafting and then create a bunch of bleeding and then have to close up with a bunch of bleeding around your bone graft. So typically try to get all your tissue release done in the very beginning. Yep. Agreed. Cause if you don't do periosteal release in the beginning, what if you shoved all that bone in there and then how are you going to get your instrument in there? Or what if you can't close it? Right. So if you open it, you have to close it. So I commonly, that's the first thing I do after I make my, uh, actual incision is I'll do a quick periosteal release and then I'll make sure that I have the closure and then I'll do my procedure. So we grafted that area. I used like 50, 50 between allograft and xenograft. We grafted that, waited another four months. And even on this one, we went from what, 2.9 millimeters of bone to eight millimeters of bone. And this one, final restoration. I think it was about, gosh, it took a little while, obviously, because I had to do the second one. I think this whole procedure started to finish. It took, took about a year. Yeah. And who here has like a 3D printer in their practice? A lot of people. What you can do is you can just have the designer or your team member design a Maryland bridge. And my team will triple print out our Maryland bridges. So when I do an anterior case, I just print out a Maryland bridge. I bond it in there. I make an Essex overlay, like an Invisalign retainer that goes over the top of it. And so then at that point, the patients are not in any type of cosmetic concern while we're waiting for integration, while we're waiting for biology and physiology to do what it needs to do. So I think this, this, this next case is combining a lot of techniques. So I think it took me about six years, maybe five, five years of doing everything where I was doing wisdom teeth. And first I started doing attractions and I did root canals and I was doing right wisdom teeth and I did oral sedation. And after my oral sedation, I was like, man, what's next? I'm going to start doing some implants. And then after I do, started doing implants, like what's next on top of that? How do I prevent complications? So I figured out how to prevent complications. Then after that, I was figured, man, there are half these cases I can't even do because some of the patients uh, in the beginning, they'll definitely find their I feel like you find the craziest patients to work on or it's the patients with the most efficient bone, right? So then I learned how to do block grafting and then I learned how to do vertical sinuses. And then it reached the point where I do and I'm like, man, how do we combine all these things into a few of our cases, right? And that's what full arch is. It is. It's basically a combination of lots of different surgeries into one. And a point I want to make that to, you know, pull on a thread that Dr. Brisky touched base on I don't know why this happens, but in the beginning, when you start to do these procedures, the patients who need them, who have money to do them are always going to be, not always, will oftentimes be maybe not the patients you want to treat in the beginning. Uh, Dr. Tobin and myself and, and Dr. O'Grady were chatting about some of our horror stories last night. Um, everyone has complications. Everyone has, you know, upset patients. Everyone has patients who aren't necessarily nice people in the beginning say no to certain procedures when your gut is telling you not to treat that patient. It will save you a lot of heartache by not having to see that patient come in upset all the time. So case selection in the beginning is really important. Like someone like Brittany, absolutely a joy to be around. So she comes in and now we're going to do a different type of case. Now, what I'd like to do is show you um, the next slide where it has like the panoramic on it, completely atrophic maxilla, completely atrophic right? Sinuses are pneumatized. You extract the posterior maxillary teeth. The sinuses are going to drift into the space. Um, she loses a lot of vertical height. We get close to the floor of the nose. Uh, rampant infection in the, you know, mandible. I mean, you name it, she has pretty much every condition. Almost there's like a little bit of that, you know, um, super eruption of the mandibular anteriors occurring too. So now you get an uneven architecture of the bone in the ma mandible. All of these different things you have to look for, as well as then gauging her VDO and where do you put the teeth spatially so her teeth aren't out to the parking lot, you know, when you restore her. This episode is being brought to you by our friends over at Nexa Healthcare, the leading answering service for dental offices across the United States. Imagine the value that you could add to your practice by being able to stay connected with your patients and even potential patients 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
Well, that's exactly what Nexa will help you do with their round-the-clock answering and scheduling support. Callers will speak with a live person within three rings, whether day, night, or even weekends and holidays. In the cases of emergencies, the calls are escalated quickly, so your patients aren't kept waiting. If you want to stop missing calls and give your patients the customer service they deserve, go to Nexa, that's N-E-X-A dot com, and use the code DPP for specialized dentalpreneur pricing. Nexa dot com, code DPP. Around this time, this is when I learned uh, how to do zygomas and pterygoids. But this patient is 30, 34 years old. And I was looking at her case. I'm like, man, what do I do? Like, I'm not going to try zygos and pterygoids on this lady. She's only 32 years old. Like, there's got to be a better way, right? So I started to do some combinations of different techniques, like lateral sinuses and block grafting to get these patients some results without having to go to the last resort. Um, this is also a case we're going to show at Neodent uh, later this year when we talk at the symposium. And keep in mind, zygos are this you know new sexy thing. Everyone's doing them. Everyone needs a zygo. Like this is end game type of procedure, right? You don't need to go and to play zygomatics all the time. What you need to consider is anything we do in the implant game is maybe going to go 20 years max. We don't have um, longitudinal data in terms of how these cases are playing out over a long period of time. So what we're trying to teach is different approaches in a way to allow a revisitation of the surgery in the future. Barring any new medical like breakthroughs or anything, which we don't have, they're doing like new subperiosteal frames. But barring that, zygomatic implants are end game type of things. It's just an absolute last type of decision to be making here. Yep, so this is the bone. <laughs> There's nothing here, right? So we have, I'd say, three millimeters of bone in the posterior, uh, right where the sinus area is. And then we have in the front, from first premolar to first premolar, we have this triangle of bone, right? And that triangle of bone is about 10 millimeters high. So you don't want to reduce anymore. If you reduce anymore, there's no bone left, right? So anything around eight millimeters or shorter, I would never reduce bone. I would augment the bone. So build it back rather than take it away. So I did a surgery where we did sinus augmentation on both sides, and I did block grafting on both sides. Uh, from the canine area to central, canine aerial central, and I did uh, lateral sinus augmentation in the posterior. So there's this article that I found about, gosh, it was like four or five years ago, and it talked about vertical height of bone in the posterior and how to get predictable long-term results with implants. And the research was saying, as I think it was 2.5 millimeters of vertical crestal height of the bone, you can predictably do a lateral sinus and the bone will stay. So any what my what my criteria is for this is uh, I'm going to I chose to do augmentation with traditional implants and all on X because I have enough bone on this one. Right. I can do the lateral sinus. I'm gaining height and I'm not worried about the bone going away. But if I had under two millimeters of bone, I actually would have changed my treatment plan. And this would have been a referral case for me at that time where I would have referred it out for zygos and pterygoids. Or tell the patient, hey, denture until you're ready to do zygos or pterygoids. So I've learned some little things over the years on how to make it predictable, right? And how to keep these results long term. And it boils down to the same philosophy. Your implant needs native bone to be, you know, integrated with. So then the rest of the graft material. So if you if you do a graft and you place it in a patient, the day you place it, you look under a microscope, it's hundred percent graft material. And then in five years, it'll be 50% graft material and 50% native. And then 10 years later, it'll be 90% graft or native and 10% graft material. The body is going to dissolve and use that as a scaffold and use the nutrients and all the particulate in there to actually create new uh, bone for the patient, new native bone for the patient. But if it's all graft material, it's a very tall ask for biology to come back and allow you to do that. So... Just doing a lateral for the sake of it doing a lateral doesn't necessarily work. So a couple of pictures of the surgery um, retracted. This was actually just an envelope flap. There's nothing releasing incisions here. Um, so I commonly, when I do block grafting, I don't make any releasing incisions. If it's in the front or the back, 
if it's, uh, yeah, really in any time I'm doing block graphs, I try not to do any release incisions, especially in the maxilla. So you don't have any areas or holes where things can leak through. So on this one, I placed uh, a 20 millimeter block graft and two tens. I uh, only placed the two tens because I didn't have a 20. I was like, oh man, I should have stocked that. So just keep in mind, like these procedures, I mean, I still think are really cool. Like I like to do them. I'm excited to go into the office to do this. Like, let's think about it like just, you know, we're, we're taking someone's vertebral graft and we're literally screwing it down and we're rebuilding the entire jawbone. And they have to, they used to have to do like hips and ribs to do this. Now we have the access to just do this uh, because we have access to better materials, better techniques. Your team is going to light up. They love it. They're all fighting to get into the operatory to be the one who's assisting on it. Now, typically speaking, um, so it just changes the the energy in your practice. Now, it depends on the practice, right? If if you're a cosmetic practice and you like veneers, and your team is not a surgically based practice, then that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But in many practices, the team will light up in order to do these procedures, and it just adds like more complexity. It adds a little bit more excitement to the day. These are actually very affordable products. The Blackcraft costs 140 bucks. The membrane I use was about $80. Uh, I actually made a spreadsheet a few years ago that had every single membrane that was made and the size, how long it lasted. And I picked all my materials because I'm very economical, just like Dr. Dune. We're not cheap, we're economical. <laughs> <laughs> So this is actually a very affordable procedure too. So I probably, I mean, if you look at it, I might have spent probably eight to nine hundred bucks in biomaterials here. Not too crazy. Uh, the cost of one J block is about seven hundred. Um, I think it's it might be a little bit expensive in some other different brands too. Seven eight hundred bucks. So it's actually relatively inexpensive for all these things. Yeah. And then same offer holds, right? If you guys reach out to us on DSN, we have all the Excel sheets, all the order forms, et cetera, et cetera. We're more than happy to share everything we have. So there's a lot of spaces in here. Um, I filled all the spaces with bone graft. So I did it with 50-50 aloe and xenograft. So that way we don't get any resorption. And I also, we commonly mix our bone grafts with antibiotic and I'll use a gentamicin or a metronidazole uh, to stay infection free. And then if you guys are using IV sedation in your practice, you can just put some uh, metronidazole or ANSEF into the bag. And then as the procedure continues, you're dripping an antibiotics into the patient systemically. And then also if you're in the camp of, okay, well, I don't like prescribing antibiotics because of the whole microbiome of the body, right? And it kills just the GI and there's a lot of new research coming out with that. Well, you're bypassing that. You're going straight intravenously. So by definition, we're bypassing the effect on the microbiome in the gut. And so you're administering antibiotics in, in a way that doesn't disturb the you know homeostasis of the patient. And here's what the bone look like. So right. I think with the first time Dune saw this one, he's like, dude, what did you do? Did yeah, you put this patient on some, some crazy steroids? Yeah, no, that's amazing. <laughs> that, like that result is just, I mean, for me, this is something that wasn't available. I've had to relearn how to do the surgical procedures I've been doing three times in the past 11 years because these things are just always continuously getting better. And then oh, people always ask us, like, what's in the roof of the mouth? This is for the digital workflow. These screws are used for uh, digital designers. So from that perspective, we're not going to be touching base on like what that actually is doing uh, for the case. Mm -hmm. And then we placed, I think it was eight implants on this one. Yeah, eight implants all lingualized to keep it away from the buckle bone. And then we did our iCam scans and delivered the same day. Um, and then here's one from this last week. And when you're even looking in the middle of it, you can see how cortexes are reforming around it, even around this part two. And, you know, you go from, you know, 2.9, three millimeters of bone all the way out to, you know, 10. So you're giving a healthy amount of bone on the front side of those implants. So there's no resorption long-term. Okay. And can we go back to the, uh, the post-operative pano? Okay. So over here, right, you have what, eight implants in the maxilla. The patient is young. It's an all on four. 
God forbid she starts losing implants over the years, you've over-engineered things in a way where the teeth just come out, the implant comes out, the bone graft goes in, the same set of teeth goes back in. You're solving problems for a 40-year-old her and 60-year-old her. Um, secondarily, you can do individual bridges. Let's say she has a really high smile line. You can just do several three-unit bridges here and then just do it that way prosthetically. By rebuilding the maxilla, by rebuilding re the mandible, by giving the patient the option for more options in the future, you've created a much better outcome for her into, into like the next 10, 20 years. So, um, and again, we go back to, it all starts with anesthetic and flap design and um, bone graft selection and how to suture. And then placing the implants at the end of the day, honestly, is the easiest part. Placing the implants is the easiest part. And you will get to that component where I was talking to, you know, uh, Dr. Murdoch yesterday. He came to the full arch course and he's like, okay, when I go home and I do singles, the singles are easier. It's because you've trained to a level higher than where you currently are. And then when you go back and do something a level less than that, it's just easier. You're more on autopilot. Yep. And implants, these are in native bone, not like the first case we showed you where it was in just graft bone. Yeah, but yeah, before or after. Um, so how many years did it take to get to this one, right? So I think when I started, this one took me almost six years to get to the stage where I actually had enough confidence to do it. So, right, this is an evolution, all right, where you're placing implants, and then you're going to learn some sinus lifts. Then you'll uh, maybe do a block graft, right? And then you'll feel confident, and then you'll eventually try this. But please, you know, let me and do know when you want to go over some cases, I'd be happy to go over any cases with anyone here. Um, let me help so I can lower the learning curve and let you guys know if you want to do them now or maybe wait a little bit longer uh, or how to get you guys there. Yeah. When you go to a CE course, once you're done with the CE course and you go home and try to implement it, that's not how it traditionally is done. You need mentorship. You need to do uh, follow-up calls. You need confirmation that your diagnosis is correct. Oftentimes with the alumni after the course, they send us x-rays and, and pictures of cases that they want to tackle. And sometimes it's the wrong case. So what we'd want you guys to do is reach out to us. Even if you don't even ever come to Colorado Surgical and you guys are DSI members, we're DSI members, right? DSI has forever impacted the trajectory of my life and my career. We are here to help in any way possible. Send us x-rays, send us pictures, take a video of your CT and scroll through it and narrate over the top of it. And we'll give you guys feedback in terms of like, hey, this is a good case. This is not a good case. Here's how I would approach it. Here's what you need to consider at step number seven where something might go awry. My favorite quote is, uh, treat your patient, not yourself. Uh, I love that one. I heard that one by Dr. Alzmari at a new dent symposium a few years ago. And it just means, and I use it in this type of case, could I have done like Zagos or Tergoids or refer the patient out for that? Yes. But I felt like that would have been for myself or for my ego. Uh, what are some other options that will protect the patient? So I feel like I'm always thinking nowadays about the patient, not about like myself. Any questions on this case at all? Yeah. So next one, this one's a pretty similar of one. This one's Lisa and kind of the same thing. <laughs> no bone again, <laughs> right? Posterior. Sinuses are completely gone. There's there's a totally atrophic maxilla again. And this patient went for probably five or six consults, all told, hey, denture, 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 right? But she's like, man, there's got to be a better way. So one thing to consider on this case, Lisa had one complaint at the end, that she had a small line right under her nose because when you do a fixed full arch, you don't have a denture flange anymore. If you take someone's denture away and you improve things, your job is also to look into the future and address the things at your consultation that they are going to be experiencing later, or it sounds like an excuse. And so we gave her a fixed set of teeth and she had a small little line there that a little bit of filler would have fixed, but we didn't address it in the beginning. And so she was a little upset about that. Now, granted, she was over the moon, happy with that, all the other results, but she chose to point that out several times throughout uh, future prosthetic appointments. So address it. If you don't have a denture flange supporting the lip, you take that out, you might have 
a little bit more of that sunken in look, or you have to graft it to build out the skeleton to support the face. The teeth and the bones support the face. If you talk like a plastic surgeon, it's the vectors of the face. So you can listen to different things and hear how different industries speak about things, and then you can incorporate that verbiage into your consultations as well. But what Dune and I really wanted to say was, hey, sometimes when you have more birthdays, <laughs> right? <laughs> but no, don't say that. Don't ever say that. <laughs> but yeah, talk about those things. Because originally she wanted to do an overdenture and she because just due to expenses, but we actually upgraded her to fixed. And it was funny that even though we upgraded her to fixed, she chose to complain about the flange not being there, right? So yeah, address everything ahead of time, be very intentional with the words, and then sometimes just through experience, you're going to find out like, oh yeah, this happened, now forevermore I will do this. So kind of the same concept, what will we do? What can we do in our practice, right? You can do a denture, you can do a full arch, um, you can maybe talk about zygos and pterygoids. Can you do the palatal approach? Can you do transnasals? Can you refer this case? Um, is this one you want to tackle? Is the patient really a good patient? Are they in need of help? Could you do it at re a reduced rate for them? Have ask in return, like, hey, do some marketing videos for us. I really like your story. Why don't you tell your story? If you're okay signing this release, we're going to use it in marketing. And then build your, you know, your um, referral base off of that case. And then you do it for a reduced rate and you help the patient out. There's multiple ways to get people to the finish line. So this one, pretty similar to the last one, no bone, <laughs> right? I'm like, uh-oh, what do I do here? This one was a while ago. I think this piece, I think I did back in like 2000 or 2019, which was 20. So we did the same thing. <clears throat> we did sinus lifts and we did block crafts again on this one. And we did all next on the bottom. And I know, don't pick me because the one implant wasn't stable hmm. <laughs> on the bottom left. So same thing, lateral sinuses and block refs. We went from, again, maybe 2.9 to 3 millimeters all the way out to like 10 or 11. And so from a lateral approach perspective, is anyone here doing laterals right now? Right, a few people? Okay, so several, several different philosophies on that, right? You can get a PA zone, cut your window. You can get the, you know, round burr and carve your window, that's how I do it. I like to leave the window of bone there, so I'll just lightly take a diamond round burr and I'll create a large window. The larger the window, the less tension exerted into the Schneiderian membrane when you push it in. And also I like that cortical bone, so when I elevate the whole sinus up, at the most superior part of the graft, I have cortical bone that's sitting on top of my graft and it's protecting the vertical volume. So that's why I choose to do it that way. Um, there's different techniques and different stopper kits and different things that I'll let you just, you know, go right into it. Um, and then secondarily, you got to look for the, what are we calling it, the alveolar antral artery um, that runs through the sinus on the lateral part of the sinus. You'll sometimes see this uh, radiolucency run across it. If you see a huge artery, refer it, right? Or you carve a really, and this is when you start to get more experience, you cut a very big window then you suture the artery on both sides to obstruct the blood flow, right? Just via anastomosis, right? Blood flow will go other places. It's not like it will get ne necrotic in that area. And then you intentionally cut the artery and then you do your lateral and then you lift it up. Obviously, this is a little bit more complex. It's something you get to at some point. But at the end of the day, just as case selection to make sure that you're referring that or you're telling the patient, maybe a bridge is a better option for you because of the location of that artery. Yeah. The first bleed I saw is actually with Ben Kakis when I was in Nicaragua. And we both, you no, know, you were with me though. <laughs> uh, There's a bone bleed and it started squirting out the mouth. And I was like, oh my Lord, I never want to see that. <laughs> yeah, and, and here's the thing. This one is scary because in an artery, there's tension in the artery. And then when you cut this thing, it's going to suck back up into the bone and you don't have access to it because it's inside the bone. It's, you know, intraosseous, you know, per se. So you can't go and like clamp this thing off. Um, when you have a regular tissue bleed in soft tissue, you can just get hemostats and just clamp the bleed. You know, stopping a bleed is just pressure. Pressure stops the vast majority of bleeds unless the patient's on blood thinners. 
So I've had patients where I've had like five hemostats draped out of their mouth, just in the mandible, just clamping these bleeds and just kind of working. So, and then again, when you get to bone bleeds, you can just burn the bone. You can get a hand piece and a big barrel crown burr, turn your water off and just go and burn the bone. It burns the vasculature uh, completely closed and it obstructs the blood flow. So, or you can get a bovie, right? Yeah. So it's like the poor man's cauterization is just a hand piece because I am a GP. Yeah. <laughs> In the privacy of this conversation, you're burning it. Okay. <laughs> if you're going and talking somewhere else, you're cauterizing it. Okay. Uh, and this one's about four years post-op. Look how the cortical shell reformed. So the body is so happy with this. Literally, the, 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 bone, the bone's natural biology reformed around the entire case. The sinuses, cortex reformed, the whole, man, a whole maxilla on the anterior portion, all of that buckle bone reformed too. So final one before and after, happy patient, except for that one little crease in her lip. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's not due to the amount of birthdays she's had, right? <laughs> And are you guys doing zirconia over zirconia? Huh? Yes. And so, um, actually, no, I'd like to pull on that thread. Um, what have you heard about zirconia over zirconia? Two concerns, at least, that we've, we've been aware of. One is the potential clacking sound. Mm -hmm. The analogy I think of is like places in restaurants, which you can hear the meeting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or just no shock absorption at all, which can then, of course, adversely affect bone with the natural work that happens. So, we've been doing zirconia over acrylic, but that's not. Yeah, good question. So uh, for, for anyone who didn't hear it or for the recording, so zirconia over zirconia, um, the uh, resonance that you hear, like the clacking sound that you hear, and then also the absorption, the shock absorption that's uh, occurring within the implants. And so I'll, I'll kind of address the, the sound effects. So in the beginning, in the consultation room, I have zirconia arches that for whatever reason we didn't use. I'll have the patients hold the temp in the final and I'll talk to them about the, the properties of the material. And I'll actually take two of them and I'll click them together and say, hey, at the end of it, you may hear this resonance. It's something that everyone has, just don't clank your teeth together, right? If you do that intentionally, you will hear that sound. So I address that. Now, if it happens while they're eating or while they're going through phonetic sounds, well, that's a VDO issue. Because then you got to look for interferences and you got to check the video. So when we do our records, we're actually using a leaf gauge and a VDO gauge. We're putting them into centric relation, right? The most superior anterior. Still don't you know, understand who came up with that definition, but put them in centric relation with the leaf gauge. And then you scan them in centric relation. And then you have your designer build the prosthetics into centric relation. And then when we deliver the arches, I'll deliver the upper arch versus lower temporaries. And then I dial them back into centric and then we redesign the lower arch and we put them back into that. And then we go ahead and put them into a final Zerk every once in a while, even after that, there'll be one interference where they kind of click together and then you reduce the interference and you adjust them back into centric. Um, and then typically it goes away. And so while they're eating and they're chewing and they're doing all those types of things, you're not going to hear the sound in resonance because you know, and I think Coist teaches this way of uh, adjusting occlusion where you have multiple sheets of paper and then you, you check where all the, the contacts are and you have anterior um, coupling where you can pull one shim stock out through the anteriors. It reduces the, the sound effect uh, significantly when, when they're, they're in function. Uh, when it comes to actual, actual flexural strength occur or flexural damage maybe or torsional damage into the zirconia, I haven't experienced anyone breaking zirconia um, it's more of a thickness of the material issue versus, um, damage to the zirconia. And then when you, got it. So, okay. So the shock absorption into the bone and the bone viability because of the forces of the zirconia, you know, and again, you know, I don't know where I'm going to end up with this answer. I'm just going to start and kind of walk through it. Um, but more so than not, titanium and, and bone are going to flex at the same rate, like the flexural rate of both those materials around the same. Um, 
if the patient's in parafunction, well, you've automatically adjusted their occlusion into a centric relation type of position. You've put them in cuspid guidance to like mutually protect all of those things. At night, we are treating sleep apnea as well. So we're doing sleep tests on these patients to see how they're, um, if they're desaturating or not. Uh, if you, if you, um, if you obstruct, typically speaking, you know, the lower jaw can push forward. Uh, it can cause bruxism when you're not breathing properly. So now we're mitigating forces through bruxism and parafunctional habits, but also helping people breathe better at night. And we're, we're putting in the fee of the sleep appliance into the overall fee for um, the entire surgery and prosthetics. So we're protecting it at night. We're protecting it during the day when they're functioning. I don't think that the necessarily the material vibrating into any material needs a shock absorber um, because the, the absence or presence of the PDL is, I'd, in, in my assumption, is not needed anymore. I think what you need to have is, is implants spread in a way where the force distribution is occurring appropriately. And I haven't seen bone loss. If anything, with neodent implants, and when you place the multi-unit on that day and you don't remove the multi and you just keep it on, we're having bone formation up and above the multis, you know, like above the, the implant around the multis. So I haven't seen bone loss as, as a result of um, force factors. No, like, but that's, the mandible does flex, right? The mandible flexes, maxilla doesn't really flex. So your question, I think, would be built around that, right? The flexure of the mandible. So the whole reason why this three on six topic has become more popular was actually because of the flexure. Uh, and breaking these up into individual bridges actually helps maintain bone, is what we've been finding. So it's a pretty cool thing, but not every case can do that, right? Yes, I think it's pretty cool if you could do it FP2, FP1 and break it up into three bridges. It will help with bone maintenance. It actually does. Lots of research articles point to that. Uh, but not every case is like that. But I think it's the best service for the mandible to have three individual bridges that will actually have the best bone maintenance. So yep. what Dr. Brisky is saying is the maxilla is fixated to the skull. The lower does all the work. And some people, when you open the, the mandible, it rotates and then translates. Upon translation, the mandible can flex in this transverse direction. So transverse, sagittal, the mandible can flex in a transverse direction depending on the masseteric muscles and how the patient is built. So sometimes when you take all these implants and you fixate them together, you're inhibiting the, the mandible's ability to flex. And then you've trapped the patient a little bit. And then they have chronic pain. And then they come in in pain and you loosen a screw and they're out of pain. So then you have to make sure you're, you're looking at each patient differently and understanding like, okay, well, when this happens, then this happens. And then I'm going to circle all the way back to well, you need to communicate with the mentors who taught you and you need to make sure that you stay in contact with them. They've probably seen this before and a quick call can fix your, your problems. Um, we do calls like I allocate five hours a week to um, CSI alumni calls. And oftentimes when we do these post-operative calls with our docs, it's things that I've done you know, over and over again and had to go through the whole decision tree of how I get to the resolution on it. Let, let's also revisit to like profitability reasons, right? So I'm charging 19500 and I'm extremely profitable on this. And the reason is if, right, a lot of people do like a Zer peak, Zer peak restoration, fantastic, right? Uh, softer, you don't hear the noise, a little bit more flexure, easy to replace some of the portions, but it's expensive. Lab bill on that thing is about 3200 bucks to 3600 uh, I know David Epstein is a really big advocator for this, but in his area, he can charge 30K in California. I can't charge 30K in Denver. It's just not where the market is. So the market is around 20 to 24,000. So we're like, hmm, let's think about what we're spending money on, right? You have five or six implants, five multi units, your bone grafting, your design fees. So I'd say all in, that's probably around maybe 4K, probably. So that's pretty good, right? But how do we cut the lab bill out? So if you get a printer, now you can print everything in house. So your temporaries, you're not paying someone to do it. You're just doing a redesign, maybe around eighty dollars per redesign to hundred bucks, uh, which is a discount that we can help. You know, try to get people on the same same discount that we get. And then for the final restoration, Dr. June owns a mill, right? I do not own a mill. So we have two different thought processes, and someday we can probably break this one down and. Dune and I can kind of hash it out and which, which way we think we should go and depending upon the growth of your practice. Uh, the reason I don't have a mill is mine's a startup. I don't have as much uh, 
staff to help me with the lab workflow or replacing that lab tech that wants to leave, <laughs> right? Once you train them up, they like to leave. We all know that. So I actually will outsource the milling to a third party milling center, like an alien milling or a primo tech, or there's several others out there. And your all in zirconia cost for a direct to zirconia for an all on X is only $1,200. So you're probably all in now, maybe 6,500 bucks, right? And that's on a $20,000 case. That's pretty good. Pretty good profitability wise. And then just to address the cost, if you mill in house, the cost of, and once you have your capital expenditure on it and your tax, you know, if you have your, t- and this is again what Jake touched base on, tax basis in, in line and you buy all the equipment and you reduce your tax implication. And I'm not even going to talk about the benefits there. If you get a mill, it's like 150 bucks for the puck but then you got to pay payroll for someone to do it and et cetera, et cetera. You can turn these things around in like 48 hours. Um, so when you get to the point where it starts doing all the crown and bridge for your practice and you start doing all the full arch restorations for your practice, then the cost savings is there, but retaining a tech and training them and having them not leverage that knowledge to go to a lab and get more money. That's the hard part. Um, either way, I do think we're coming up on time potentially, or are we doing okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, any other questions though? On it, yeah, Dr. Gomez. So, good question. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't use Rosen screws. They they will fracture. They don't t- they loosen up. So I don't like Rosen screws. Um, Dan Rosen heard me say it on a podcast actually. He actually asked me why I'm telling people not to use a screw. So don't tell him, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like Des Des screws. They're nineteen point zero one eight. Or Vortex comes from Danny Deming, amazing screw too. Uh, Powerball works as well, but it's a fatter screw uh, and it's a little bit hard, harder milling strategy. So I really like desk screws or Vortex screws. I'll use desk screws and I'll reuse them actually with my temporaries. And then when I go to my final, I switch my screw to Vortex screw and then I mill my finals in Vortex. The Vortex screw for everyone, it's actually a round bottom. Uh, to the screw versus a square. The desk screw is a square. So the idea is it has uh, angle. You can actually have angle changes when you screw it down, which is really cool. And also they're seeing less uh, zirconia fractures too. So keep in mind, like that whole conversation took three years to wash out. <laughs> yeah. And so like we, we have to test out all these different screw channels. We have to look at the longevity in these patients and we got to figure out like, okay, what's going to tie down the best and what's going to be the most economic um, but we've done Rosen and Des and Neodent and I've bonded tie bases and I've done chair side conversions and we've done every version of this prosthetic workflow. As we sit here today and check with us, if you start to Im- implement new things, like if this conversation occurs in a year, we may not be using Vortex screws in a year. But as we sit here today, the Vortex or now as it's called the LaViz screw is, is the best one that we have right now. Yeah. Any other questions? So... I mean, I don't think we have another case to present. Either way, um, at the end of the day, we are in Colorado. You need us for any reason. Reach out. We're here to help. You don't have to come to the course. You can just literally reach out if you have a surgical question. Uh, me and Dr. Risky love doing this stuff. Like, I really do like enjoy all aspects of surgery, right? I love surgery. I love sedation. We do have a really robust program built out. We're continuously adding to it. But nonetheless, you guys are all DSI members. We are here to, to give back. And obviously, in the abundance mindset that Mark has kind of set for the group, um, we're just here to give back the information freely and anything we've kind of created or discovered, we're here to share. Just understand with this type of clinical stuff, the philosophies do change over time. So what we're saying today may be different in two years. Yeah, I absolutely love DSN and especially DSI. And if anyone needs help with any cases, feel don't be shy. Please ask me. I'd love to help. I'm a huge nerd. I get kind of fired up when people ask me questions like this. I'm like, yeah, let's get, let's get to the finish line a little quicker than I used to. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hey doc, are you overwhelmed? Sick of being the bottleneck? Not sure where to jump in and tackle projects? The idea of having an assistant may seem like a luxury and something you don't need. However, as practicing clinicians, business owners, husbands, wives, moms, and dads, you may be holding yourself, your business, and even your family back by not delegating day-to-day tasks and maximizing your valuable time. 
If you guys have heard our podcast and webinars before, you know I hired a personal assistant eight years ago and haven't looked back. I hired Ashley Evans at the time, now Ashley Hirschfeld, and we were able to execute, prioritize, and launch projects and businesses that have led to multiple streams of income and invaluable peace of mind. Ashley has now founded GSD Queen, where she is helping busy entrepreneurs and business owners find the right personal, virtual, or executive assistant to help you get the momentum you need to reach your goals. With Ashley's assistant program, you get one-on-one consultation with her to create your perfect personal or executive assistant avatar and ad. Execution of placing ads, review of resumes, skill and personality testing to narrow down to two to three candidates. Guidance in maximizing in-person reviews. After selection and hire, the assistant will receive four weeks of GSD Queen Bootcamp where they will learn the tips and tricks to being an efficient and forward-thinking assistant. Reach out to Ashley directly at 928 910 3599 for more details and more information. If you happen to be a DSN member, reach out to Ashley inside Workplace to get a $250 discount. 928-910-3599. Reach out to Ashley and get ready for a life-changing experience. And that wraps it up for another episode of the Dentalpreneur Podcast. Look forward to reconnecting on the next episode. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Dentalpreneur Podcast. Check out truedentalsuccess.com for full recaps of every show, a schedule of our live events, free video tutorials, and a whole host of practice-building resources. 